Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Liverpool University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Anno 1800 the board game. And so hopefully after watching this video you'll be in a position to play this game. Coming up. Let's learn to play Anno 1800, game designed by Martin Wallace and published by Cosmos. Let's get to the table. Based on the computer game of the same name, Anno 1800 is a game of industrial civilization building for two to four players. Each player controls a home island of basic industry and workers, and through the game they will use those industries and workers to gain additional population, to build more industries, and to build docks and ships, which in turn can be used to expand their empires or to trade with opponents for the industries that they lack. The player who can use their industries to produce the most satisfied population will earn the most influence points and win the game. In this video, we are teaching you from the German version of the game, but the game is mostly language independent, and so this won't impact the teach. We may, however, use some translated terminology which differs from the final English translation of the rules. To set up the main board, you will gather all of the common components and place them onto the spaces which bear their icon. You'll have two of every industry tile, some more of the docks and ships, four decks of cards representing population and expeditions, which should be shuffled before being placed, and two stacks of tiles, representing the old world and the new world, which once again are shuffled before being placed face down. To the left of the board you'll place all of the population cubes in their corresponding spaces. All of these components are limited in the game. If any of them runs out, the actions associated with them can't be taken anymore. Each player takes a player board representing their home island. This shows their starting industries, docks and ships. Each player then takes their starting population from the common supply. This will be four green farmers, three blue laborers, and two red craftsmen. For each population cube, the player draws one of the matching population cards. And so each player will begin the game with seven uneducated worker cards and two educated worker cards. These go into the player's hand and are held secretly, away from the other players. On each starting ship, place a naval token matching the icon in the bottom corner. So trade tokens on these two ships, and exploration on this one. Shuffle and deal out five of the game's mission cards at random, putting the rest in the box. In your first game, it's recommended you search for and find the five cards which show three diamonds here instead of one, as they're good for your first game. The lighter coloured cards represent extra ways to score in this game, and the darker coloured ones represent extra actions or rule changes available. Finally, choose a first player who takes the first player token. The second player takes one gold, third player takes two gold, and fourth takes three gold if applicable. You're now ready to play. Before we go through the rules of the game, I'm going to quickly show you where your points are going to come from because there are a lot of things that you can do in this game, but ultimately only a few which directly score you points. Firstly, a lot of points will come from your population cards. You will gain these cards to your hand when you gain population, and then you will score them by spending the resources shown at the top of the card. And this will require you to develop the associated industry. The second way to score is through expedition cards. You gain them through the expedition action, and you score them by having enough educated workers to fill these coloured squares. Thirdly, you'll be scoring based on the specific objectives on mission cards drawn at the start of the game. There are also some points for leftover gold, and for being the one who triggers the end of the game by getting rid of all cards from hand. With that in mind, let's see how the game plays. Anno 1800 is played in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table until the end of the game. On each turn, the active player takes one action out of the nine available in the game. 
Actions are fairly quick, which means that play will proceed quickly around the table. The nine actions can be split into four broad categories. There are the industrial actions, which include building, industries, docks or ships, increasing population, or leveling up population to the next level of education. Two of the actions relate to resolving your hand of population cards. These are to play a population card or to exchange cards from your hand with cards in the deck. There are three exploration actions, which are to unlock the old world, explore the new world, or draw expedition cards. And there is one reset action called celebrating the city festival, where any workers or tokens that you've used are restored, ready to be used again. Most of the actions you'll take in the game require you to spend the resources that are produced by the game's industries, and so we need to understand how to do that. The fundamental way to think about it is that you will employ the game's workers to activate an industry and then immediately use the resource produced. So let's consider one of the most basic examples, building this bakery. Building it requires wheat and coal, and so to do this action, you can employ one green farmer to gain the wheat and one red craftsman to gain the coal. The cubes you use must come from your district spaces and go on to a matching colored empty job site. You can only move workers this way onto your own industries, not another player's, and these workers remain there until you take the reset action. Some actions include a specific type of worker as part of the cost, rather than just industry resources. To build these goods, you would move one craftsman to your brick factory, and then for the second craftsman, you would simply move it from your district to your exhausted area, which is simply an area off the side of your board. Like workers on job spaces, this will stay here until you next take the reset action. Sometimes the job sites that you need are full, or maybe you've run out of workers of the type you need. When this happens, you may choose to pay gold in order to retrieve a worker, either from a job site or your exhausted area, back to its district. This is called the end of shift, and you may do this as many times on a turn as you wish. The cost to perform end of shift depends on the quality of worker. So a farmer costs only one gold to retrieve, but a craftsman would cost three, an engineer four, and so on. Performing end of shift both frees up the job site and gives you another worker of that type. And so in this case, the player would now have enough farmers to build this sale industry. The other way to gain a resource is to trade with your opponents for it. And you do this using your trade ships and specifically these trade tokens. There's a multitude of reasons you may want to do this. Maybe you simply don't have the industry that produces it. Maybe you do have the industry, but it's full. Or maybe you just want to save the worker that would be required for another purpose. Whatever your reason for trading, you go through the following steps. First, find any one opponent who has access to the resource you want to trade for somewhere on their island. It does not matter whether that industry tile has an empty job space or not, you will be able to trade for it. What is important is the color of worker that that tile requires. The active player must exhaust trade tokens from their trade ships equal to the trade cost for that type of worker. So for the blue laborer, it's one trade token. It's two for a craftsman or three for an engineer. Then the player with whom the trade occurred gains one gold from the general supply. The opponent cannot refuse the trade and in the event that multiple opponents have access to the same resources, then the active player chooses whom to trade with. A player may trade as many times as desired on a turn, as long as they have enough trade tokens to afford it. The only restriction is that a player cannot trade for the same resource more than once on the same turn, even if trading with different opponents. This restriction is important for the actions where you can build multiple copies of the same thing on the same turn. All of these means of gaining resources will be important through the game for all of your different actions, whether they are using your workers as normal, exhausting workers as part of the cost, 
paying gold to bring workers back, and trading with your opponents. You'll need to use all of these to build up a good civilization. Bear in mind as well that although gold is worth some points at the end of the game, its primary purpose is to be spent bringing back your workers. So don't be afraid to do this if the situation arises. Keep in mind though that if no player has the industry that produces a certain resource, then you cannot trade for it. There's nobody to trade with. In this way, the players will be building their industries collectively, starting at the lower end and building up to the more luxury end. So with that, let's look at how each of the actions in the game works. The first action is to build, and this can be split into three subtypes. Building an industry, building a dock, or building ships. To build an industry, choose an industry tile from anywhere on the main board. Pay its cost, as we described before, and then flip it over and place it onto any country space on your board. That is anything in these middle three rows, so not the districts and not the sea. You may choose to place on an empty space, or to cover over one of your pre-printed industries, or even cover over one of the industries that you've already placed. If you cover an industry that has cubes, the cubes go to your exhausted area, and if you cover a tile you took from the board, return it to its position on the main board, ready for someone else to build. From the start of the game, there will be two copies of each industry tile on the board, and no player is allowed to build both copies of the same tile. You are, however, allowed to build an industry that produces the same resources as another one of your industries, as long as it utilizes a different worker type. Your second build option is to build a dock tile, which is one of these three stacks of tiles. This works the same way as building an industry, with two exceptions. Firstly, it can only be built on the coast, which is this specific row adjacent to the sea. And secondly, you are allowed to have multiple copies of the same dock. Your final build option is to build ships, which come from these six stacks here. Unlike industries and docks, when you take a build action for ships, you are allowed to build as many ships as you have docks. Each dock builds its own ship, and the level of ship, which is equal to the number of icons in the bottom right corner of the ship tile, must be equal to or less than the dock's level. So this player could build a level 1 and a level 2 ship, or two level 1 ships. Each ship that you build has to be placed into a C space, and as for docks, you can have multiple copies of the same ship. When you build a trade ship, immediately place a number of trade tokens onto that ship based on its level. You've now increased your trading capability, and since you build ships one at a time, you may spend those immediately to gain the resources to build your second ship. When you build an exploration ship, you'll immediately gain exploration tokens equal to its level, and you'll be able to use those on subsequent exploration actions. The second action is to increase your working power, and this is how you gain new population cubes. On a single action, you may gain up to three new population cubes, as long as you can afford the costs. To take a cube, choose the cube colour you want to take, pay its cost, which represents the amount of resources needed to build that worker's house, place the new cube into the corresponding district, and then, if there are any population cards remaining of the corresponding type, take one and add it to your hand. Later in the game, if there are no cards left of the corresponding type, then you must pay additional gold to take the action, either one gold for an uneducated worker, or three for an educated. Population cubes are gained one at a time, and so the first cube you gain could be spent as part of the cost of the second cube you gain, and so on. Gaining population is a critical part of your game, as this is how you gain the population cards that give you a lot of your points, and how you gain the cubes that score expedition cards. The third action is level up, which allows you to improve your population cubes to the next level of education. As for the previous action, you may level up up to three cubes for a single action, and you take those level ups one at a time. To level up one of your workers, choose any cube, whether it be in your districts, on a job site, or in your exhausted area. 
pay its upgrade cost, which is shown to the right hand side of its district box. So here for example, a brick. Return the old cube to the supply and then replace it with one level up. This may result in a cube being on a non-matching job site until the next reset. You do not gain a population card for doing the level up action. And if you level up a blue cube to a red one, you do not get to change a blue population card to a red one. You will stay with your lower value card. You should consider this action carefully. It can be situationally helpful because in the moment it costs fewer resources. But in the long term, it's actually more expensive to turn a farmer into an engineer than to simply get an engineer outright. Leveling up does not give you any point scoring cards and you retain your same overall cube count, meaning there's no extra time between resets. This is not to say that the action is never helpful, but it may not be as strong as it appears. The fourth option is to play a population card, and when taking this action you may play at most one card, taking it from your hand, placing it face up on the table, and paying the resources shown at the top of the card. Doing this scores you the influence points for that worker, which is 3 for an uneducated worker, 5 for new world population, or 8 for an educated worker. It also grants you a one-off bonus effect, which is printed in the middle of the card, and which is playable at any time as a free action. To use that effect, simply flip the card over. The exception is a card showing an exclamation mark next to the effect, which must be played on the same turn as the card. I'll cover the different population bonus card effects later in the video. A less common action, but one which could be valuable in the right circumstances, is to exchange population cards. And this allows you to try to hunt through the population decks looking for better cards, whether those be cards that you can afford with your industries, or cards with better engine building bonuses. To take the action, first discard up to three of your population cards to the bottoms of their corresponding decks. Then draw the same number of cards from the same decks. The next three actions are exploration actions, and the cost to take them is to exhaust exploration tokens from one or more of your ships. The first of these actions is to unlock the old world, which allows you to add these old world tiles to your island, making it larger. The cost to take this action is one exploration token the first time you take it, two the second time, and so on, up to a maximum of four. You cannot take the action more than four times. So you spend the tokens, take the top tile from this pile, and place it next to your existing board. From now on, you have new space to build industries, docks, and ships. Each old world tile comes with a bonus. In some cases, it's a pre-printed industry or ship. And do note that it's possible that this may result in you having two identical industries. This is allowed, but do note if you had gained this tile before building this industry, you would not have been allowed to build this. Other potential bonuses are population, which grants you immediate population cubes, plus the cards that come with them. And do note that if the decks are empty, you would have to pay the gold to get the population. Or you could gain expedition cards. The second exploration action is to explore the new world, and this is paid for in the same way as the old world. One token for your first, two for your second, and so on to a maximum of four. Once you've paid the cost, you gain the top tile from this pile, as well as three new world population cards, as indicated by this icon on the back of the tile. The cards are added to your hand, ready to be completed in the usual way, and the tile is flipped over and placed above or near your home island. This will give you access to cotton and a random two of the other five New World resources, cocoa, sugarcane, coffee beans, rubber, and tobacco. These resources are necessary for building these six industries in the bottom left corner, as well as these two luxury industries. New World industries are activated not with workers, but with trade, and so, to build this particular resource, you would need to exhaust a trade token with your new world. You are not allowed to trade with an opponent's new world tiles, only with your own. 
and the New World is not considered part of your home island, so you're never allowed to overbuild the resources there. When you build an industry, it must go onto your home island. Exploring the New World is the only way to get access to cotton, and for the other five New World resources, the only other means to get them is with this specific population card bonus. The final exploration action is to go on an expedition. Spend two exploration tokens, and draw three expedition cards. These simply go face down into your play area, although you may look at them, and are not considered to be part of your hand. These are used only as part of end game scoring. The last action option is to celebrate the city festival, and this is your reset action. Retrieve all cubes from job sites and from your exhausted area, and return them to their matching colored district ready to be used again on subsequent turns. Additionally, replenish all of your ships to their capacity with naval tokens. That is, either trade tokens or exploration tokens. It is possible, through various effects, that you possess either more or fewer naval tokens than your capacity, and at the point that you reset, any excess are discarded, or any shortfall made up from the supply. You take no other action and play moves to the next player. And so, those are the nine actions available. To quickly summarize them again, you can build, which can be an industry, a dock, or one or more ships. You can gain up to three population cubes for their cost, also gaining the corresponding cards. You can upgrade up to three population to the next level up. You can spend the resources to play a population card, unlocking its points and bonus. You can exchange up to three population cards with the next cards on their deck. You can explore to unlock the old world, giving you more space and a bonus. You can explore to open up the new world, gaining new world resources. You can explore to go on an expedition, granting you end of game bonus point cards. And you can celebrate the city festival, which lets you retrieve any cubes or tokens that you spent on your other actions. Before I take you through the end of the game, I'm just going to give you a little bit more of an insight into the industries and bonuses available in the game. At the start of the game, you have 10 basic industries which cost either farmers or craftsmen, as well as some basic ships. These five industries in the top left corner of the board repeat your five starting craftsman industries, but allow you to activate them with a cheaper labourer. There's also a second wood industry, activated with a labourer rather than a farmer. These give you more flexibility, or the ability to repeat on these resources more frequently, and they open up trade because these will be cheaper than the players building their own with craftsmen. These eight industry in the middle of the board are your first manufacturing steps, which are activated with blue workers. These are often required for the blue-green population cards, and are generally the prerequisites to the next steps of manufacturing. These nine red industries are your second steps of manufacturing, activated with craftsmen and often costing engineers to build. These are often required to activate the five and eight point population cards, as well as to build the luxury items. These six industries function similarly, but require the new world resources. These six industries are your top luxury goods, they all require engineers to activate, and generally require investors to build, and most of the game's 8 point population cards require at least one of them to complete. The board also contains the 3 types of docks, the 3 types of trade ships, and the 3 types of exploration ships. All ships require sails or steam engines, and the exploration ships all require cannons or artillery. I'll also quickly summarize the bonuses that you can get from population cards, as they will be a key part of your engine building. You can gain gold, new permanent population cubes, which once again come with either population cards, or an additional gold cost if the cards are all gone, or you can gain temporary trade or exploration tokens. From the time you gain these by activating the card, you will have until the next time you reset to spend them otherwise you'll lose them. These grant you up to three free upgrades of the population cube types shown, and this, as we saw before, gives you once-off access to a new world resource. This bonus grants you an extra action, 
And this bonus lets you discard up to two population cards from your hand to the bottoms of their respective decks. This may be useful in controlling the end of the game, which is what we'll talk about now. The end of the game is triggered when a player's hand is empty, usually by playing the last card or discarding the last cards through the effect of another card. The player who triggers the end of the game gains the fireworks token, and then you will finish playing the current round, followed by playing one more round, using the first player marker to remember who went first so that everyone has the same number of turns. Then count up your final score. All population cards that you've played from hand, whether you use the bonus effect or not, are worth the printed number of points. Three for an uneducated worker, five for new world population, and eight for an educated worker. Any cards still in your hand are worth no points positive or negative. Next you'll score any of the expedition cards you gained by moving red, purple and turquoise workers across to matching coloured squares, like so. Any squares that you fill are worth one point for a red worker, two for purple or three for turquoise. On each of these cards the left hand box shows an animal which represents a zoo animal and the right hand side represents an artifact which goes in the museum, but for the purposes of scoring you can ignore the pictures and simply focus on the colours or icons. Refer to the five mission cards and then score any of those that have an end game scoring bonus. Some of these will simply give you a number of points for each time you've achieved what's shown on it. Others are scored by majority, so for here the player who had the most trade tokens would gain 10 points, second most would gain 4 and the others would gain nothing. For this sort of card, ties are friendly. Finally, players gain 1 point for every 3 leftover gold and whoever triggered the end of the game gains 7 points. The player with the highest score wins and in the event of a tie, whoever has the combined most industry, ship and dock tiles on their home island wins and if still tied, whoever has the fewest cards remaining in hand. If still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Anno 1800. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video or find this video is useful, please help us by hitting the like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new and exciting videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please write them in the comments section below. Hopefully I'll see you in our next video. Bye!